Hello and welcome to the MB Om podcast, where you will learn to master the business of yoga with guests from around the world who have experienced becoming successful yoga teachers, studio owners, and much more. Now, here's your host, Amanda Kingsmith. Hey guys, welcome to the MBOM podcast. Thanks so much for tuning in to today's episode. I'm really excited to share today's episode with you. It's with a special lady who's super close to my heart. Her name's Chelsea Orth, and she's just one of the people that I love most in this world. And we met at yoga teacher training in Bali. So we haven't known each other that long. And both of us are newer yoga teachers. Uh, Chelsea has been teaching really consistently since returning from Bali. And I thought it would be really cool to have Chelsea on the podcast because I designed the podcast out of a need that I had for myself. And I felt like other people would have that need if I was having it. And Chelsea has been my go-to gal for everything yoga throughout my teaching journey. She's the person when I have a sequencing question, I think of her first. When I'm struggling for confidence, I turn to her. When I'm terrified to teach a class or do an audition for a teacher, I call Chelsea. And so it it almost felt wrong not to include her in on this exciting podcasting journey that is a part of my life now. And I think that there's so much value from learning from other people who have been teaching for so much longer than Chelsea or I have. But Chelsea's so new into it that she's really fresh with her learnings over the last six, seven, eight months being a yoga teacher. And that's something that, gonna, what, that I really love about this interview is that she shares really openly about the things that she's learned, what it's been like to just kind of dive in. Chelsea and I are such great friends, but we're so different. I like to analyze and make sure everything makes logical sense. Whereas Chelsea just dives in, you know, both feet, jumps in, doesn't really think twice about it and kind of just figures it out when she's there. And it's something that's super cool. So that's exactly what she did with teaching yoga, just like everything else in her life. So I will say no more about Chelsea and we'll get right to the interview and I hope you enjoy it. All right, Chelsea, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. It's amazing to have you here today. I'm excited to be here today. This is something new and exciting that I've never done before. Cool. Well, I'm super stoked that you're here. Um, guests already know we did our teacher training together and the focus for the podcast is really giving new teachers information that they might not get from their teacher training. So coming out of teacher training and being like, Oh, what do I do now? I guess I got to start teaching. And so I thought it'd be really cool to have sort of like fresh eyes on it. And I know that you've been teaching pretty consistently since being home from Bali and just talking about what that's been like for you. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of challenges that I never expected And it's been a really fun learning process going through them and being able to talk to you and to other yoga teachers that I've known for a long time. But, I mean, like one of the challenges I had was being caught up in my students not listening to the cues that I was giving. And then I sit back for a little while and I'm like, okay, well, maybe the cues that I've been giving is because this person is not in the present moment, and they're not paying attention. And that's okay, because everyone is in their own yoga journey. And so if they're not listening, it's it's okay. They'll come back to class, and they'll figure it out. Yoga is a lifetime practice, and everyone starts at a different spot. Everyone is somewhere different each and every day. So that's one of the big challenges that I remember talking to you about earlier this summer, and that's something that I've like overcome. I'm like, okay, you know, I'm teaching yoga. People will take what they need out of it for the day. And I'm glad to be doing that. Yeah, no, I've definitely experienced that as well. It's, it's interesting when you kind of like step up as a yoga teacher and you're like, why aren't you doing it? Like, why are you in class if you don't want to do what I'm instructing you to do? Right. I feel like we have this idea in our head that we're going to have this perfect yoga class every time that we teach. And it's not always going to be that way. So you have to learn to go with the flow. So that's another thing that I've been working with. And, 
Yeah. <laughs> like in terms of like planning your sequences and stuff, do you mean? Or planning sequences, but there's also this past week I was a little under the weather and I didn't realize it. So as I'm teaching, I was having this coughing attack and I'm like, oh gosh, what are my students going to think of me right now? So they're just hanging out in a downward facing dog while I'm trying to drink some water really fast. Knowing that everything's going to be okay <laughs> because people understand that I'm a human being as well. And sometimes you have to cough and cross, especially if living up in Montana. I feel like everyone is always sick up here because it's chilly. <laughs> yeah, definitely. So, I mean, so just knowing that everything's going to work out throughout your class, even if it's a teacher doing something like, you know, taking a moment because they need to clear their air or collect their thoughts. Your students are there to have a good time. So that was one of the, that's another challenge. It's every day brings something new. Yeah. Have you found too that it's like something I struggled with is watching people and trying to get feedback from them and realizing that like everyone's just serious. Like people don't really smile at you. They're not giving you anything back. And it's, I know that's something that I really struggled with when I first started teaching. I was like, oh my God, I think I suck. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's always kind of weird. I feel when my students lock eyes with me. Mm -hmm. Like, are you paying attention or are you just staring at me? I'm not really sure. But, yeah, feedback is good. If I notice that some of my students look so serious in class, you know, I'll make the comment, let's turn our mouths, the corners of our mouths upward, and then I start smiling, and I feel like you can start to hear the smile come out of my voice if I'm demonstrating something with a student. And so hopefully I can lighten some tension. But, yeah, having a whole audience stare at you while you're trying to teach class was a little nerve-wracking at first. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, Especially the first couple of classes. It was like, okay, I really don't know what I'm doing, but I'm here. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like it's gotten easier as time goes on, or do you still get kind of nervous to stand up in front of the room of people? Oh, yeah, it's definitely a lot easier. In the beginning, I would use some essential oil blends just to try and calm me down because I had so many nerves running through me. And now I walk into my class and I'm like, okay, awesome. I have familiar faces. This is going to be a great day. I know what level each student is at. And if I have to explain something a little more but give options and modifications, then that's really great because it also challenges me. But the more you teach, the more it's a lot easier to walk into your class every mm -hmm. day that you do teach. Yeah, definitely. Do you still kind of like bring a notebook with sequences in it or have you like kind of moved past that? So I've dibble dabbled with that. Ever since I started teaching, I have written down every single sequence, but then there'll be times where I haven't been as prepared and I'm like, okay, I can walk into class. I usually keep the same routine in the first 25 minutes as we slowly warm up and stretch on maybe throw some other things in there if I want to, you know, spice up my class a little. But as soon as it comes to my flowy part of a sequence, I realize that I do have to write things down. Not that I'm necessarily looking at my notebook, but just to, hey, if I need a quick reference guide, I'm going to go back. Like, what's the next step? And if I'm not prepared for my class, I feel like I'm letting my students down because I'm not prepared for them. And so I always have it written down. I always have my introduction, how we're going to warm up through the beginning of class, and then move through the rest of the flow, how we cool down, and then finally Shavasana, mm -hmm. which is the best part. Oh, but yeah. I, always have to, I always have to write that down. And I definitely recommend that as well because all of a sudden – there might be something that happens in class and then you get sidetracked and you really do need to go and look at your notes and make sure that you're on the right track. Yeah. I think it's good to have at least like a plan in your head, you know, if you don't have a notebook or a cell phone with it there right beside you. Right. I, like I, I'm no, I'm definitely not at the point where I can just kind of walk into class and be like, okay, I have no idea what we're going to do today, but we'll figure it out. And I know there's some experienced yoga teachers who definitely do stuff like that, which I think is, you know, quite commendable because I'm not there. But I was talking to one of the yoga teachers that I really, really admire um, from Banff. And she said that even after 15 years of teaching, she still plans her sequences. 
Yeah. You know, and I think it really depends on everyone's personality. Are you very organized? Can you just go with the flow? Um, do you have the experience to go with the flow? But I'm a person that I like to write everything down. Any thoughts or ideas I have, I always have a pen and paper. It's handy, so I can write it down. And so, yeah, I like to write things down for class, and I'll always do that. Maybe there will be a time in my life that I won't need to, but it just brings some comfort knowing that I have it all written down. Yeah, definitely. That makes a lot of sense. And so going yeah. back to before doing your teacher training, how long was it like before actually doing the training that you knew you wanted to be a yoga teacher? I was laying in bed one night and it was about a year and a half before I actually made it to training. I told myself that I'm going to work really hard and save a bunch of money to be able to make it out to Bali. And I had practiced maybe for six months before that, but it just came to me. I was like, okay, well, this is a cool idea. If I teach yoga, I can also travel the world and spread this love. And yeah, it was crazy. This whole journey to think back on in the last like three years now from this single idea of becoming a yoga teacher. And now I've been teaching for six, seven months. It's crazy to think about because yeah. it was just an idea and I was able to manifest it and make it happen. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. And so what was your first yoga class like? Like, were you just immediately like, whoa, I love this. I need to do this. Or did it kind yeah, of grow so, on you? Well, I was traveling down in Nicaragua and we were staying at this place that included a yoga class in town in San Juan del Sur. And so it's like, okay, rallied up everyone who I was with. We're like, we're going to this yoga class. I've always wanted to try it. Everyone talks about how awesome yoga is. Let's go. So I remember sitting in this classroom having no idea what I was doing. It was an open classroom with no windows, but some sheets hanging down. And I remember sitting in class like, okay, I'm looking around at everyone, including the teacher. What am I doing here? (laughs) And then all of a sudden I found myself at this place of stillness and calmness. And I started to listen to everything around me. And there was a little elementary school right next door, and all these children were outside laughing. And I remember just being so happy that I was able to experience yoga, like, for my very first time. But I also had another connection that I was able to hear all these little children laughing. And if you find the right perspective, you can find that it's beautiful. You're in a foreign country. It's awesome that these children are having a great time. You know, or you could come from this perspective of, oh my gosh, these children are laughing. Like, I'm trying to practice yoga right now. But, you know, stop interrupting my shavasana. (laughs) Exactly. So, my first yoga experience was really great. And I remember coming out of the classroom feeling so happy. And, like, I found this bliss within myself. So, of course, I had to talk everyone into making our way back into town later on that week because I wanted to go back to another class. And that's kind of where it kick-started. Once I came back to Bozeman from Nicaragua, I instantly bought a month membership to a studio in town and found myself waking up at 7 a.m. to make it to class at 7.30 every day. And I remember feeling so great about my day that this was something I wanted to continue to do for myself because I was finding the true meaning of yoga. It wasn't just practicing asanas, but it was this whole yoga woven into my life. How do I be a better person? How do I bring a smile to people's face? Where do I bring love? And so that's really what kickstarted it. And then it was about eight months after that when I had this idea to become a yoga teacher. That's super cool. And then I found, I don't know what it was like for you, but for me, it was really overwhelming picking a teacher training. Like everyone and their dog had an opinion on where I should go and who I should do it with. (laughs) And it was just like so overwhelming for me, like almost to the point where I was like, maybe I just shouldn't do this. Like, I don't know if I'm making the right decision. (laughs) And somehow you and I ended up at the same training. So I'm just wondering how you settled on that one. I honestly hopped on to Google and I knew that I wanted to go to Bali. I wasn't thinking about any other places. And I read the reviews about Santosha. And actually, a friend from Bozeman was going to do this training with me. And she's like, 
Santosha really looks like the one I want to go do. What do you think? And I had my eyes on another, um, another course. And then I realized, okay, Santosha was in my, in my budget. I'm going to go with Santosha. And I think you and I are just a little different. I'm more, okay, let's go do this. I don't know. I don't really plan on things <laughs> where you really, <laughs> you really like sit and analyze which is going to be the best option for you. So when a friend said, go to Santosha, I was like, okay, that's what I'm going to do. Here we go. <laughs> yeah. And my flight to Bali was booked shortly after that. <laughs> that's incredible. Yeah, no, I was very, very all over the place. <laughs> I spent hours on the internet and I originally wanted to go to India and I like looked at all these places in India and I don't know Then I decided I was too scared to go to India by myself as a Caucasian female <laughs> and <laughs> freaked myself out about all that. And then I remembered somebody had actually told me about Santosha and okay. I had looked it up as one of the original places they'd gone to India to do it. And I like, they didn't have a program happening in India. So I immediately wrote it off and then it came back to my mind and I was like, well, Bali would be pretty freaking cool. So maybe I'll do that. Cause I've heard that they're good, <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you definitely then- nailed that. I was I spent hours trying to decide. It was quite difficult for me. (laughs) And I mean, it it is kind of a struggle to try and pick a yoga teacher training because you are investing time. You're investing 200 hours just of course material plus all the time if you are going to travel to a destination yoga teacher training. So there are a lot of different things that you have to factor in there. And I think that every yoga teacher training offers something special. I remember this intense bond that we had with all 35 of us by the time that we left after 23 days of getting to know each other. Mm -hmm. And so any yoga teacher training that you can find and that seems like a good option for you, I always say go for it because every yoga teacher training is going to be a different experience. Now, some do specialize more in like a hatha style or a vinyasa or kundalini. And I liked ours, how ours was more anatomy-based, and we kind of covered everything, and we covered all eight limbs of yoga. So it wasn't just so specific, and I really enjoyed that part. Yeah, I liked that too, how it was like we came out with a like vinyasa flow based off of like hatha yoga. I I feel like that's cool because it allows you to teach in so many different like studios and classes and different styles and stuff like that. Yeah. And once you leave training, then you're able to go off and make your own spin of what you'd like to do in your yoga classes. You know, what do the students need and what can you provide for them? So it's, it was a really nice, like general broad understanding of what yoga was, but then you come back and you you start teaching and you're like, wait a second. Do I really know what I'm doing right now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I've doubted myself quite a few times. So I'm like, I don't know if I have the skills to be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Do you have any um, advice for I- people who are potentially haven't done their yoga teacher training and are looking to do one and are feeling sort of like flustered by all the options out there? Pick the one that looks most interesting to you. You, your heart always knows what it wants. So if there's one that's sticking out, like you said, Santosha kept coming back to you, even though they didn't have a course in India, but they had a course in Bali, that called to you. Mm -hmm. And it brought us together, and you never really know what's going to happen. Every part of life is such an adventure that no matter which route you go, you're always going to have a good time. It's all about your perspective. Yeah. So... If there's one that's calling out to you, I definitely recommend doing it. Yoga teacher training has definitely changed my life. I'm more open-minded, and I feel like I have a greater sense of love towards everyone, and that's exactly what I was looking for now that I ponder back on all of it. (laughs) Yeah, that's incredible. I love that. And so coming back, Um, you... Sorry, what were you going to say? Nothing, go for it. <laughs> I was going to say, coming back, you pretty much jumped right into teaching, right? Yeah, as soon as I came back into Bozeman, I went to go talk to Crystal, who owns the studio here in town that I teach at. And she goes, oh, perfect, you're in town. I need someone on Tuesday to start teaching. 
And I'm like, yep, okay, I'll do that for you. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, oh, boy, what did I just get myself into? Here, I thought I was going to have at least a couple of weeks to start teaching, and all of a sudden, she needs a substitute teacher for a certain class, so here we go. I remember sitting down, going through all my notes from training, and getting a little nervous. And when I walked into the classroom that morning of my first class, I'm like, okay, Essential oil time, what's going to calm me down? Do I have some lavender? We're going to do this. And I remember sitting in my first class. It was such a surreal experience because I remember looking outside of my body and looking at myself, and everything I was saying was just coming out of my mouth so naturally. And I thought to myself, have I taught yoga maybe in a past life? (laughs) It came so natural, and everything I was worried about, it didn't happen and it was all good. Yeah, that's amazing. It's crazy how we kind of like create like our fear and our nerves. Like we become so scared of things that aren't even, you know, things. Like the worst that happens is you cue the wrong foot or the wrong hand or, you know, I mean, maybe, you- maybe somebody walks out. Like that's the worst that can happen, I feel like. Right. So I always do that. I'm always mixing up my words in class. I'm like, right foot. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant left foot. You guys got it right. You know what you're doing. And then I give a giggle because I'm human and we all make mistakes. And sometimes when you're doing the opposite thing that everyone else is doing, you do say the wrong stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was one of the things too, that being a new teacher, I'm like, okay, am I going to cue all of the right things? Because I want to be this perfect teacher. Mm -hmm. When in reality, everyone messes up every once in a while. But jumping right into teaching, it's a whole new experience that I didn't necessarily know if I was ready for. And I kind of just dived headfirst into a lot of things. That's my personality. So I just went with it. And seven months later, I have so many wonderful students that come to class on a regular basis. And I've gotten to know on a personal level. And it's it's just been a fun journey. That's awesome. I remember... I remember you calling me about how nervous you were to sub your first first class. Did you get asked to sub a class just randomly and you said yes? Yeah. So, well, so I was working at Lululemon at the time and a girl came in who I knew from town, who's a yoga teacher. And she was like, Oh, you're back. Like, how was your yoga teacher training? I was like, Oh, it was incredible. She's like, do you want to teach? Because so many people do their yoga teacher training and they don't really want to teach. And I was like, yeah, I do. And she's like, cool. Do you want to sub my class next Tuesday? And I was like, uh, what? <laughs> I guess so. Yeah. I if I want to teach, I guess I do. <laughs> and then, so that was happening. And then on Monday night before the Tuesday that I was teaching, I got a text from a girl I work with and she's like, Hey, I'm really stuck for a yoga teacher for our staff meeting tomorrow. Do you want to teach our first class for the staff? And I was like freaking out. I remember (laughs) like losing my mind, like freaking out. Like I was supposed to bike home. It was going to take me an hour and a half to get home. I freaked out, called Ryan. I was like, I need you to come pick me up. Like, I don't have time to like bike home. I need to put a sequence together. And I was just terrified. It was like, just, yeah, the whole night I was having queuing dreams and I was afraid that I was going to miss something. It was awful. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, it, it seems like it's only natural for the first few classes, the first couple of months that you teach, you do have these nerves and eventually they go away. But you know that every class that, well, I would be okay. Everything will work out. <laughs> yeah. And I know but, for me, I had this idea that when I was cueing somebody into a pose, you know, we learned so many different cues to say when that person's in the pose. And for, I don't know how other teacher training assessments are, but for ours, they really wanted us to say all of them. So I kind of had this idea. I'm like, okay, I need to make sure I say this and this and this and this and this and this. And now I'm kind of like, okay, I know all these things. And if I hit a couple of them, that's great. I can hit a couple more on the other side. You know, I can hit a couple more the next time we do the pose. And it's not a huge deal if I miss one of those cues. Like people get it. Right. And even if it's someone's first time in class or they're an advanced practitioner, if it's your first time, you naturally look around because you don't necessarily know what you're doing. 
And if you're an advanced practitioner, they're like, okay, oh yeah. So if I'm, if the teacher's cueing this alignment for me to pull my right hip back as my left hip comes forward, I know that already. Or the beginning, the beginner student will be like, okay, yeah, that makes sense. I'm going to do that. But I feel the same way as soon as we got out of training, I'm like, okay, we're going into Parsva Uttanasana. We're going to lengthen up through the spine. We're exhaling to lean over the right leg. As we pull the right hip back, the left hip comes forward. Your arms can come down. They can stay at your hips. Like, do I have to say all of these, all of these things at once? <laughs> or do I hit a couple? And, you know, your students will follow along and they know what they're doing. <laughs> Yeah. And it's interesting too, when you think about yourself as a practitioner, because some of the cues really like hit home. Like, I know for me, my hips are always jutting out like either side. So when somebody's like, draw your hip into the midline, I'm like, oh, yep, hip come in. But some cues I'm like, okay, like I don't really, you know, do that thing. So I don't connect as much to the cues. So you can never really like plan for saying cues that everyone's gonna, I guess, necessarily be like, yes, I needed that cue if that makes sense. Right. Yeah, some some cues will resonate with people and other cues won't resonate with people. But the best thing about this is throughout your yoga journey of myself and yourself being practitioner, we pick up on it. We start to learn more about our body and we get to know our body a lot better because we slowly are opening up through our hip joints and through all these other major joints that Maybe if we didn't hear this cue before, earlier on when we've been practicing, we we heard the cue now, and then we can make all of these connections of, oh, that's what she's been talking about this whole time. Okay, because you're starting to get to learn your body more, and that's the fun part of yoga is knowing as a teacher, it's okay if someone doesn't understand your cue right away because they'll find the growth within in themselves to be able to understand later on it might not be an instant gratification kind of thing yeah definitely and something that I struggled with when I first got back was feeling like I was giving all the cues that were needed like especially I find this in from plank to chaturanga because so many people don't do it properly that it's it's really frustrating for me when I'm like cueing it how it should be cued how I was taught to cue it and people still aren't doing it and yeah. it's something that I asked a teacher that I really respect back home. And he was like, well, what do you think? And I was like, well, I don't know. Why don't they just listen? And he's like, it's just like how it is. You know, he's like, you can right. adjust them. You can do it beside them. But like, you just got to have faith that you're going to say it enough times that eventually they'll be like, oh, I'm not doing this right. Right. And yeah, and it's all part of everyone's own yoga journey. If they get to find that within in themselves. You know, are they present enough to listen to your cues? Because we as teachers feel like we're doing a pretty good job, but sometimes we don't always know if we're heard or if someone's listening to us. So that's a big challenge in itself. Is Like I was talking about earlier, are people present? Are people listening to what we're saying? Are we giving a really great experience for these people? I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah, no, that's totally fair. It's it's hard not to kind of like base your, I guess, your confidence as a yoga teacher on sort of what you're getting back from your students. Because I feel like a lot of people will just be like, okay, thanks. And then they leave and you're kind of like, did you like it? Did you not like it? Like, you could just tell me either way. Mm-hmm. And there's some, you know, after class, if I have a few minutes, I'll offer that. I say... I'll be hanging out in the studio for a few minutes after class if there's any comments or questions. And I feel like that really opens up the idea of people coming up and talking to the the teacher. I remember when I was a student and I first started going to the studio that I teach at now, and I looked up to these yoga teachers and I'm like, oh my gosh, they're so cool. I want to be their friend, but I don't really know what to say besides thank you. And then slowly I realized that I started asking more questions and was able to build a more personal personal level with these yoga teachers. But at first I was like, I don't know. Do I go up and talk to them? Do I tell them? Or do I ask them for help on what I maybe need? Or I specifically remember a yoga teacher coming up next to me, and I think I was going through a vinyasa 
So keep your elbows into your sides. If you're only going to go halfway, keep your elbows at 90 degrees. Then come up into an Urdhva Mukha Shavanasana and then back to downward dog. And it's like, okay, so she did it with me and that was awesome. And I think that, you know, I give her props to being a yoga teacher that wanted to come over and help me because she saw the struggle, even if I didn't necessarily say it out loud. Yeah, that's amazing. And so would you recommend for like new teachers who are coming out of a training or coming back from a training similar to just jump right in? I don't know. I think that really depends on how comfortable you are. Like I said, I dive head first in the things and I worry about my consequences later. And <laughs> thankfully, you don't really have consequences being a yoga teacher. You just have to you know, have the courage to do it and kind of sometimes you just have to do that in life is be courageous and know that if you're doing this, you've got it. Like I remember Sunny, our teacher saying, everything you need to know, you will know at the time that you need to know it. So everything will come to you. You're not all of a sudden going to forget anything. And then it also comes back to writing down everything for your first few classes. If you are feeling really nervous, your students aren't going to necessarily know that you are checking your notes every time they're in downward dog. And that's okay. You can come back to that. But it's all personal preference. I think go for it right away while you have everything fresh in your head from training Come back, start teaching. You'll start learning things about your teaching style and about yourself right off the bat. And it may take you a couple of months to have some reflection to look back on that. But I can't believe how much I've grown as a yoga teacher in six months. And being a brand new yoga teacher at that, it's pretty exciting to see some reflection and some growth within myself. Yeah. And what sort of like ways have you grown or self-development have you seen in your in your teaching? The confidence right off the bat. I know that I have to walk in. I have to have this presence about me that I'm your yoga teacher. I'm here to keep you safe. Um, We're going to have a great practice. That's something I never would have realized, that I actually make a difference in everyone's life, even if they don't always come and tell you that. Yeah. And it's something very subtle that you don't necessarily realize and so you have a student come up to you. Um, I had a student go, I was talking about you to my husband this last weekend. I'm like, okay, well, I don't know your husband. Huh, what were you saying? And she's like, well, at the end of class, you always just were sitting in a fetal position, and you say, okay, now we know this all the space and the peace we created within ourselves today. Can we that with you throughout your day for whatever comes your way? And just know that everything is going to be okay. So that's something I say a lot in every one of my classes. And she came up to me and she goes, I just felt this moment of just this weekend with my husband. And I just looked at him and I said, you know what? Tell she that everything's going to be okay. Just come back to this moment of silence, this moment of stillness. And here we go. And I was like, oh, wow, I made a difference in your life. Like you were talking to me, to your husband, about me, to your husband. That's really cool, you yeah, know, and that's different incredible. Things resonate, different things resonate with your students, and what are they going to remember? Because, like I said, like we were talking about, not everyone's present, but sometimes people will pick up on different cues that resonate with them, or different things that we have throughout class that they are able to take with them outside of the classroom, and that that was a big, big growth for me. Is oh, I'm making a difference in someone's life. Yeah, it's cool to know that people are taking your messages with them, you know, through their days, through their weeks, even if they're not telling you. And I think it's one of those things that I think it's really easy to be like, oh, did I do a good job? Maybe I like shouldn't say that quote next time or I shouldn't, you know, say that inspirational thing. Like people didn't really seem to respond to it. But remembering that you don't need that response from people and that you just need to do what you feel is right and what you feel is good. Exactly. Yeah. No, that's awesome. Um, what is sort of, have you found a good balance between teaching and practicing? That's the kind of goofy part is 
I'm trying to find this balance through every aspect of my life right now. It's been a fun challenge, but I hardly find myself practicing at home. Uh, if I do go and practice, it's usually in the studio, and I find myself teaching a lot more than I'm actually practicing. Mm-hmm. So then I think to myself, you know, if I am practicing and feeling throughout my own body and having these experiences, I'd be able to share that with my students more. Or sometimes I feel like I have a dull week in my teaching that maybe I wanted my class to be a little more exciting than it was. Taking it for what it is always, but then knowing that if I do self-practice, I'm able to share more experiences with my students from what I'm learning throughout my body to hopefully share with them and go from there. But this relationship of me self-practicing either in the studio or at my house is pretty low right now. I find that I'm so busy in my life and it seems like an excuse, but I do try and at least move through my body even if it's 10 to 15 minutes a day not necessarily moving through like a whole hour practice on my own. Yeah. I think that's important for people to remember in general that you don't always have to do an hour practice. Like, you know, 10 to 15 minutes of movement is amazing. Yeah. Um, Do you find yourself practicing a lot and then teaching? I practice a lot in studios. So that's kind of an interesting... I mean, I've got a few different yoga teacher friends who have sort of like different perspectives on it. And I'm trying to self-practice more. It's hard for me because I get really distracted in my house. Like I turn the mat towards a wall and I set a timer and put music on. And sometimes I find that I'm like, oh, I was flowing and now I'm just practicing handstands, which is like, <laughs> you know, that that's cool. But, you know, yoga is not just about doing handstands. Or (laughs) if I happen to like glance at my laptop, then I'm like, oh shoot, I need to send this email or I need to check this or I need to do this. Or if I see the kitchen, I'm like, oh, I'm kind of hungry. Maybe I'll go get a snack or, oh, those dishes are like really building up. I should do them. So So we find all these distractions. Yeah. Practicing at home is really, really difficult for me, but I find it's not hard for me to get to a studio. Um, the more I teach, the harder it is because when you spend time at the studio all the time, you kind of want to not be in the studio. Like I know my biggest week of teaching has been seven classes in one week. And it was really hard for me to fit in a self-practice in any way, whether or not that was guided by somebody else or by myself. And I had to really like force myself. Right. Um, and it's, it's hard to have a self-practice at home because there's so many distractions. If you're lucky enough to have a spare bedroom or an office that you can maybe set up your mat in and just flow from there. But, you know, I have a dog at home, so it's really hard when he wants to come practice with me. So maybe that's why I find myself not doing as much self-practice. I never really thought about all the distractions, like, out loud like this before. So it is nice to be able to go to the studio and practice, but I, I can agree with you on the fact that okay, well, I taught at the studio this many times this week. I don't know. I have other things I need to do. Do I really have time to sit through an hour-long yoga class with another teacher? Or it's kind of like this back-and-forth thing in my head. Mm -hmm. You know, am I practicing today? What am I doing with my day? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. No, I feel you for sure. I find, too, like the more I teach, um, the pickier I am about, like, classes that I go to. Like a few years ago, I just go to whatever yoga class and I was like, okay, cool. Like I'm at yoga. And now I'm way more pickier about whose classes I go to. And I really like to go to teachers classes where I can learn something as a practitioner, but also as a teacher. And that's very true. I like to get some inspiration from different classes I go to because every teacher is going to bring something different to the table. And maybe something resonates within myself that day. I'm like, okay, well, I really enjoyed that. Maybe I'll try and bring that into one of my classes and see what happens. So I like going to other classes to get some inspiration. It really helps me when I'm developing sequences for my own classes. Yeah, that's the same as me too. And I know I have one yoga teacher friend who does her self-practice is like all about developing these really unique sequences. And I find for me a self-practice 
I, I'll definitely like self practice sequences that I put together, especially if it's like the first time I've, I'm going to teach it. But I find yeah. that I'm not at a point where I come up with like a ton of really original stuff. Like I kind of do sort of the standard yoga poses. And I don't think there's anything wrong with those. I just don't feel like I come up with anything unique on my own right now. Right. And I feel like I have this pressure to become a very, or to be this very unique yoga teacher. And then I sit back and like, okay, and Marty unique because I'm my own person and I teach class differently from other people. I do take different things from some of my favorite yoga teachers that I've been able to practice with. But, oh, my train of thought, Amanda, is going all over the place. <laughs> Your what is? My train of thought has gone all over the place. Oh, that's okay. <laughs> um, is that pressure that you said, is that coming from yourself? Like to be a good, to be a unique yoga teacher? Or do you feel like that's coming from like somebody else? I, I, I feel like I have these high standards to myself to be this unique yoga teacher. But then we come back to the eight limbs of yoga, that yoga is not just all about your asana and such a practicing in class. I'm trying to cultivate this unique experience within my class that, okay, all my classes aren't going to be the same every day that I teach. I want to mix it up slightly. But I'm trying to cultivate this place within my students where they feel comfortable enough to come into my class because they're able to reach some peace of mind by the time that they leave after an hour long class. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's where I was going with it is that I feel pressure to be this unique yoga teacher, but I have to step back and realize that it's okay that I am. I am my own unique yoga teacher, not because I'm coming up with these unique sequences and we're flowing for a really long time, but because I feel comfortable enough that my students are leaving having a great day after they take this 7.30 a.m. yoga class, you know? Yeah. Especially when I'm teaching that early in the morning, it's really nice that we can come from this place of love and this place of calmness, and by the time that you leave, you feel okay about your day, even though you may have a to-do list to get done by the end of the day. Mm -hmm. That's really, I guess, what I'm ultimately trying to bring into my students is, hey, everything's going to be okay. We're going to move throughout our daily lives. I'm so glad you were able to come practice in class today because that means you took an hour for yourself. You took an hour to forget everything that you had to do and you just were able to be present. Yeah, which is pretty incredible. Ultimately, that's my goal for teaching these early classes. Now, I'd say it's a little different if you're teaching an afternoon class because maybe you want something a little more flowy. Maybe you're looking for something else. In, In my teaching style, I'm just really like to move through all the major joints and really feel good about your body because when you're not stiff or tight anymore, you can go on having a better day. But hey, you also got to hang out in Shavasana for five to ten minutes and really calms everything down too. So it's it's a body, it's a mind, it's a soul. How do we connect everything all together? Yeah, which is pretty amazing. It's That's one of the things I love about yoga too is this like physical work and this like mental clarity and then this like complete relaxation at the end. Yep. Yeah. And everyone's going to get something different out of yoga, whether it's your yoga training, whether you are a beginner, whether you're an advanced practitioner, it's all about what you begin to notice in the synchronicity within your life, within yoga, and it all comes together. And it's this beautiful spiraling energy that just continues to happen throughout each and every day. Yeah. No, that's awesome. And you're teaching at a climbing gym as well as a yoga studio, right? I am. I was able to find a few classes at this climbing gym that we have here in Bozeman. And that's been really different because at this, at the climbing gym, they really wanted, you know, like power yoga and workout yoga. Well, I'm coming from this place where I want yoga to be a very calming thing for you. I want you to come in and open your body but feel good at the end. So for a long time, I was having this struggle at the climbing gym. Okay, well, do I do a single ohm at the end of class like I like to do at the yoga studio I teach at? But do I do that here? Like, do people think I'm going to be like this 
weirdo <laughs> for being so spiritual or do they understand what the meaning of om is? Yeah. So for a long time, I would just end my classes saying, hey, thank you for coming to class, you know, end with a namaste. But then I realized that that's not me teaching my truest form of what I think yoga is. And so I started adding in the om at the end of class. But I had this stigma and this idea in my head that going to a climbing gym was a totally different type of yoga because they really wanted a workout yoga. Mm -hmm. And I really want yoga to, you know, be all about calming down your mind and having a good time. Yeah. So it was this really big struggle within myself. Do I bring any spiritualness to this yoga class? And then I realized that I wasn't having as much fun teaching. I was like, you know what? You can do whatever you want. These people aren't going to judge you because you wanted to do an OM at the end of class. They're probably really going to like that you're bringing um, this style of yoga to the, to the climbing center because there is a lot of like power yoga or hot yoga, and I'm offering something a lot slower. Mm-hmm. So that's another. It, there's all these challenges that come up within myself and what I should do and what I shouldn't do, and it, there's always going to be something. But yeah. how do you change your perspective and look at it a little differently? Yeah, definitely. And I think that's an important way to look at it. Have you found that you've gotten good results from like sticking to the way that you like to teach at the climbing gym? Yeah, um, a lot of people really enjoy it. There's, these past couple of weeks, I've been taking up Tuesday and Thursday morning classes. And then I always have a Saturday at 9 a.m. class. Oh, so, that's, that's incredible. This week, I was able to teach an 11 and 8-year-old in class, and they were two boys. Yeah, they were brothers. They really had a good time. It was their first yoga class ever, and I was a little worried. I didn't know if they were going to listen to me. I didn't really know if they understood what I was saying. What's the child's brain like at 8 and 11 years old? I don't know. (laughs) I don't know. I wasn't a boy. And... (laughs) And so that was that was exciting. I was like, okay, I'm going to teach the class how I always teach it. If the boys need to look up towards me, I'm demonstrating through the entire class today. I did have a few beginners in class as well that they told me that before class started. So it's, okay, hey, I don't have these people who come to my class every single week. How do I slow down? And how do I make this more at a beginner's level? How do I explain things clearly enough so they don't feel stupid, you know? So they feel like they know that they have a good grasp on everything. It, it's just been a challenge. It's, it's something totally different teaching at a climbing gym than going into this sacred space of a yoga studio. The climbing gym is loud. There's always people talking or screaming or there's kids downstairs having birthday parties. Um, <laughs> just a completely you know, different environment. <laughs> it, it is a different environment. They did a really good job trying to create some sound barriers. And I can only turn up my music so loud in class. So learning how to deal with that. And these people know that they're at a climbing gym doing yoga, but how do you make it a sacred space for them as well? And that has been one of the challenges. So thus far, since I've been teaching there in October, uh, or since October, but I find a really great crew of students that enjoy those slow morning classes. And I think they like that because every day that they're out climbing, they're constantly exerting force throughout their body. Or I have all of these very athletic people in Bozeman that are mountain biking. They're going out skiing in the backcountry. You know, they need something a lot slower. So it's been nice to bring these slow, slow vinyasa classes to the climbing center. I feel like people do appreciate that. Yeah, it's super interesting transitioning from, like for me, from a small town that's, you know, really similar to Bozeman with a huge outdoor community where people really are into, you know, slow flow or yin yoga or restorative and coming to this massive city where people want, they want their stretching and their workout all in one go. Which makes sense because you look at the type of styles that people or the lives that people live in big cities. It's a usually really fast pace. So how do I fit in my workout with getting a stretch in with trying to find peace of mind all within like an hour to an hour and a half yoga class? Totally. So it's a different dynamic where in the mountain towns that we were living in or are living in, people want to slow down and they want to feel good and stretch. 
where it's a little different in a big city. Yeah. And it's interesting to, you know, find your sort of like style as a teacher. And like you were saying before, really like stick to your style. Cause I think that that's really important. And that's something I've discovered in the last six months that, you know, there's a certain way I teach and I'm happy to kind of, you know, change some things about my teaching for a studio, but I can't fundamentally change like who I am as a teacher and I have to stay true to that or I'm not going to enjoy what I'm doing. Yeah. And I did, I felt a little lost when I first started at the climbing gym because I felt like the climbing gym had these expectations of me as a yoga teacher. And really in all reality, I had free reign to teach however I wanted in a class. And I don't know why I was making this barrier with myself because it, I needed to stick to my true self and do what I know and love about teaching yoga. And so I'm, I'm not sure why I made up that story um, that I couldn't do some things that I wanted to do or why people might judge me for what I was doing in class. Yeah. So, I mean, I think yeah. that's like pretty common. I feel like it's kind of like this human quality that we all have as humans. Yeah. I suppose that's very true. <laughs> <laughs> we just kind of are always so hard on ourselves and we create these things that aren't actually true. I mean, I've done it before and I've kind of just realized that somebody will give me feedback if, you know, it's really not what they're looking for, especially if it's the studio manager, or the studio owner, or, you know, the person at the center that is doing the yoga. Like, I think they would probably tell you at some point if it was really not what they were looking for. Yeah, exactly. But like you said, we always make all of these stories within ourselves. Like we are too hard on ourselves. We have to learn to just accept ourselves for who we are and go with the flow. Yeah, definitely. Um, what sort of advice would you give people who are just returning from a yoga teacher training from somebody who's, you know, pretty fresh out of training, but is like you've taught consistently for the last six, seven months. And it sounds like you've learned so much in that time. The advice I have is go back through all of your notes because you learn so much throughout a teacher training. Some are very intensive where we finished our 200 hours in 23 days, but some are also um, expanded over weekends in a few months. But I say go back over your notes. I can't believe all the things that I wrote down during yoga teacher training that slipped my mind. And I'm constantly referring back to the different notes that I had written down or going back to your manuals that your teacher training gave you. They're there for a reason. They're your resources. You went to school. There you go. Use these books. Don't just let them sit on the shelf. And then another big thing, especially if you're going to do a destination yoga teacher training is give yourself time to come back down. Mm -hmm. I felt like as soon as I got back into the States, I had all these people around me had all these expectations of what was I going to do next? Like what's happening next? And really I just needed to take at least a week to hang out with just myself, really know what I was going for and try and figure out everything that was, that just happened. You learn so much in your training from philosophy, theory, to anatomy. And we kind of have this um, like spiritual awakening or conscious awakening throughout training that I felt was really hard for me to deal with. I felt like being in this third world country of Indonesia, like they live so simply. And then we came back to the States and it was really hard for me to get grounded. Mm-hmm. Like what did I know before I went to training What's it like to come back as a new person, essentially? Because that's how I felt. And so take a week for yourself. Take a few days. Sit with yourself. Start to meditate on different ideas. Look through your notes and just know that everything will come naturally when it needs to. Amazing. I love that advice. Yeah. I'm not sure if you felt the same way. I was in Minnesota for a few weeks after coming back from my trip. So it was a lot different than hopping on and teaching right away in Bozeman because I knew that once I was getting to Bozeman, I had a few weeks. And then all of a sudden I started teaching. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure if you felt like you had to come down and get a little or be a little more grounded. 
after your training or what advice would you give people? Um, so I have worked like the very next day after I got home. Like I got okay. home like late at night and I worked at like 11 a.m. the next day. And it was weird coming back because I'd been gone for a month. All my friends at work were really excited to see me. They wanted to hear all about my training. And it felt like I'd had this like crazy dream that people That's wanted to exactly, know That's exactly, I guess. Yeah, how I would put it is this crazy dream that just happened. <laughs> yeah, it was like, because it's, it's weird coming home. And I mean, Ryan and I talk about it so much on our travel podcast, but coming home from a, a trip and especially something where you've had a really life-changing event or events happen to you, it's really weird when you come home and everything's kind of the same. And it kind of is almost like it makes what you've gone through feel really surreal. Like you're like, did I actually do that? Did that actually happen? Or have I just like been here the whole time? And I just had it this like really freaky, like very, very right. dream last night. <laughs> so yeah, I was definitely there. Like I was kind of like buzzing and I feel like the best way to describe my head would be like kind of whirlwindy. Yeah. And, and so it, it- it was really nice that I was at home with my parents to be able to try and ground myself again. Yeah. Like, yeah, here we I are. think that's important. <laughs> if I was to do it again, I would definitely give myself at least a day off work, if not like two. Right. Like allow all of your thoughts to try and process of what just happened throughout your yoga training, knowing that taking time for yourself is always great. It's not selfishness. It's self-love. Yeah. Knowing that you can go off your thoughts that way. Yeah, totally. And yeah. <laughs> it's important not to lose like all that you've cultivated. And it's kind of this interesting thing because it's something that I really encourage in my yoga classes, like move slowly. Don't just jump up and throw your shoes on and your jacket on and run out of here for the next thing you need to do. Like move slowly. And I think it's the same thing if you're a teacher coming back from a teacher training, kind of give yourself that time to like breathe and that space to process everything that you've like learned and the ways that you've grown. And I definitely didn't give myself that space. So, I mean, it's fine. It's not like anything super bad came out of it. I think it just, when I did have my first weekend, I was like, oh, whoa, I was like super jet lagged and (laughs) (laughs) what just happened again? (laughs) Oh, right. Yeah. I went to Bali for a month. (laughs) I learned a lot about yoga for the last month and then I started working right away. (laughs) Yeah. Like it was crazy coming back and people being like, Oh my God, like, what did you learn? And I was like, I don't even know where to start answering that question. (laughs) Give me a little bit to think about it and then I'll share all of that with you. (laughs) Yeah. Like it's just, it was so like crazy in my head and I was like, came back and I felt like I mean, it's, you, you've got kind of this new identity. You're, you've gone from, you know, a lover of yoga and a yoga practitioner, a yogi, yogini, whatever you want to call it, to a yoga teacher. Like, it's kind of this massive shift. But for us, it happened so fast that I was like, am I really that? I don't know. I know. And like I was talking about looking up to these yoga teachers when I was a student, I was like, oh, my gosh, these people are so cool. They are doing everything yoga the way that they want to, and they are teaching. I think that's so amazing. And then all of a sudden, you're in this position where maybe your students think that about you, <laughs> and you're sitting here like, wait a second, I'm still brand new at this. Like, don't think I'm some like awesome, amazing yoga teacher. Take one of my classes first and then see what you think, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. It, it, it's, a different, it's different because you're on the opposite side. You still are a student. You still are learning yoga, but now people look at you a little bit differently because you teach yoga. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's kind of this like change in expectation. Like you're different because you teach yoga and don't just practice it, which I guess you, you are in a sense, like you've obviously learned enough to be a yoga teacher, but it's, it's weird to describe when you're in it. Cause for me, I didn't even like say that I didn't identify, I guess, as a yoga teacher for a really long time. Like I was like, I don't know. I'm like this person who did a teacher training. <laughs> it's like a yoga yeah. teacher. I'm like, I don't know. It just doesn't like feel right yet. You know? <laughs> yeah. Or if I'm like hanging out with some of my friends and I meet someone new, they're like, oh yeah, Chelsea teaches. She's a yoga teacher. She teaches yoga. And it's like, what? That's so weird to still like to hear. And it's been a few months. I'm like, 
I'm a yoga teacher. Okay. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I definitely not, feel you on that one. <laughs> yeah. Cool. I mean, just the yoga teacher training in general, I recommend for everyone to go and experience. You don't have to necessarily ever practice yoga before you go into yoga teacher training. Yeah. I feel like there's a couple of students in our course that had never practiced yoga before. And yeah. they came in and dove right in and, you know, got to have their own experience and their own adventure throughout their training and take from it what they wanted. And I think that that's the best part is you can go and study and everyone's going to learn something different because of the way that we perceive everything at that certain time in our lives that we're taking this yoga training. Yeah. I think it's really good for yeah. anyone to do a yoga teacher training because like for me, I feel like I learned more about myself than I actually learned about yoga. Like I obviously learned a ton about yoga and teaching yoga, but it's so much about the personal development. Yeah. And the personal growth that you have. Mm-hmm. I, you know, have, like I said, I have opened my mind so much to new ideas in every which way that they could come to me. And ever since I did my training, it's just been so much more. I just, I want to learn more about what our bodies are doing, about what our mind is doing, what psychology has to do with yoga. And, you know, what is yoga for everyone? Yoga means something different to every single person. And it's kind of nice that yoga is able to transform like that and evolve through different time eras and that, you know, yoga can always be this constant thing, except you're always changing with yoga as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. It's pretty cool. Yeah. So many self-development and self-growth spurts that, you know, I'm sure that I'm still growing and I haven't quite figured that out yet because it always seems, you know, a couple weeks go by and then I look back and I'm like, oh, Okay cool. Well, that happened. What did I learn from that? Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of this, I don't know about you, but when I was younger, I had this like perspective that when I was in my twenties, I'd kind of like have it all together. Like, it's just how I perceived my parents, I guess. Like, you know, like my parents, like they know everything. And now I like, I turned 27 in a couple weeks and I'm like, I know like nothing. (laughs) You know a lot. I, no, I do know a lot, not, obviously, but you know, I just thought I would. Ideal. Yeah, I just thought Sorry, I'd know. I thought I'd know everything when I was in my mid twenties. Right, and then it's these um, expectations that society has on us that we should know everything in our twenties. Yeah, like we should become all... adults and just know what life is about and what the world is about. And I'm like, I think I'm still right. just figuring this out, and I'll probably just keep figuring it out until I die. Yeah, and I mean, having the curiosity like that in your life kept helps keep you a little bit younger and more adventurous. Yeah, definitely. And you're always learning. You're always learning new things about people, about the world around you. And, yeah, it's it's just a fun journey. And I think that, you know, this yoga teacher training just opened my eyes to what all the possibilities I can have in my life and how do I create those within my life. It's just not that I'm teaching Austin at classes and it's how do I live a yogic life? How am I respectful to others? How do I show love towards others? Um, how do I handle different life situations, whether that be a death within a family, within the family or friends? And, you know, maybe I was really high stress when I was driving in the car and I had road rage, but now how do I cultivate that differently? okay, so if someone pulled out in front of me, it's going to be okay. Go with the flow. Everything's going to be okay. And I think that's one of the best parts that yeah. yoga taught me is to slow down and to realize that we don't have to rush through our lives, that our lives are an adventure and we get to go on living them how we want. We can go fast-paced. We can move a lot slower. It's just It's opened so many doors for me as a person. It's got my mind really thinking of, well, what's my next mini goal? What am I going to do next? How can I keep living this yogic life within myself? And how do I make others smile? How do I bring happiness to others? How do I bring happiness to myself? Do I need to sit down and meditate more? Do I feel like I'm going too fast, a little off balance? That sort of thing. 
Yeah, no, I, I love that. I feel like that's amazing advice and something that I think that everyone should keep in mind, like not just yogis or yoga teachers. I think that that's an important lesson for everyone. Definitely. I can just relate that back to my training because that's when I feel like all of my growth started to happen when I started to realize all of this. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, so just yeah. one last question for you that I'm asking to everyone on the podcast. And I guess it's a little bit different for you because we've kind of, we've kind of touched on it, but I'm going to ask it anyways. It's if you could go back in time to like Chelsea, right. As she returned from Bali, what advice would you give to her now that you've been teaching for like seven months? <laughs> Stop worrying. <laughs> I know that everything, everything will be Okay. As soon as I got back from Bali, I didn't have a place to live. Um, I have a dog, so that's also very hard. And then I had all these little, like, real-life things that I had to worry about or that I felt like I needed to worry about when really everything always works out, especially if you set the intention forth that you need a home to live in or that this needs to go this way for you. Or do I have a job when I get back? So just learning to go with flow especially if I'm traveling abroad and then coming home after the training is don't worry. Everything will be okay. Yeah. That's awesome. That's something that I have to remind myself on like a weekly basis. I will have these mini panic attacks about things that don't matter. And then I'm like, just take a breath. It's all going to be okay. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So I think that's really great advice. Cool. Do you have anything else to add before we wrap this up or? I think that I kind of went off on some tangents and I think I got most of everything covered. (laughs) Cool. I like tangents. So I way prefer things that are just come from a place of authenticity than are super structured and rigid. So I appreciate you just sharing everything on your mind. Well, thank you. Um, It was fun doing this whole podcast interview. I really enjoyed you asking me to come on to the show today. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Of course. Thank you. All right. So there's the interview with Chelsea Orth. I hope that you guys enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed being a part of it. And I hope that you've really been able to take some stuff away from somebody who is a really new yoga teacher. I think there's really this benefit in getting opinions and advice and just hearing from somebody who is not that far ahead in the journey than you are yourself. And so if you want to follow Chelsea's yoga journey, um, she has a Facebook page called Peaceful Warrior Yoga, which is pretty beautiful. And then if you're in Montana, Bozeman specifically, she teaches at Your Yoga. I'll put some links to that on the show notes. So you can check that out, www.mbomyoga.com. As always, if you have any questions, comments, If you want to say hi, shoot me an email, info at mbomyoga.com. I'm always happy to hear from you. And as always, thank you so much for listening and being part of this incredible community. Bye.